are in record mode. And Suba, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Trudy. Trudy always does an amazing job uh, wel welcoming everybody. And I really appreciate that of Trudy. Well, good afternoon, one and all, and welcome to the February edition of Tuesday Explorers, a series of lifelong learning opportunities brought to you by ARP Virginia. So thank you for joining us today. I'm Suba Sadi, an ARP Volunteer Community Ambassador with AARP Virginia. AARP is here to make your voice heard and provide information and resources on the issues that matter and to connect you with fun learning opportunities. We provide valuable educational, informational, and fun resources, things like webinars, teleton halls, discounts, and more. I'd like to thank my co-host and helper today, Trudy Murata. Like me, Trudy is a volunteer community ambassador with ARP Virginia. She'll be monitoring the Q&A box and will facilitate the Q&A portion of our program. We will have time for Q&A at the end of today's presentation, so please submit your comments and questions in the Q&A box. You can even do that when Professor Cook is talking. We expect the program to last for about an hour and 15 minutes. During Black History Month and beyond, AARP wants to shine a spotlight on local leaders who have helped their communities survive and thrive. I'm truly excited about our program today. The way I found Professor Gregory Cook was I read a very interesting article in the Washington Post, and the highlight of it was film honors African women who were Rosie the Riveters during World War II. Um, as I was reading it, of course, Professor Cook's name came up quite often. I said, well, I've got to track him down and have him as a speaker for our Black History Month February series. So I contacted him, told him who I was. We had some amazing phone conversations. Well, to say we succeeded and uh, got him on today. So that, that's how it all happened. Professor, so let me do a little introduction on the professor. Professor Gregory Cook is a career educator documentary filmmaker and World War II historian dedicated to helping relocate African-Americans from the margins to the main pages of American and global history. He is the creator of Invisible Warriors, African-American women in World War II, a critically acclaimed feature-length documentary that explores the wartime experiences of 600,000 Rosie the Riveters, hidden figures, pioneers who courageously triumph over racism and sexism to create job opportunities in industry and government for themselves and future generations of African-American women. Gregory earned a BA in English from American International College and a master's degree in journalism from the Ohio State University. He's had a colorful career. He did marketing, communications, renovated houses, did freelance travel writing, served as a human resources manager, parked cars, managed a court reporting school, delivered pizzas, and survived six train crashes as a freight brakeman with Conrail before teaching and retiring from Drexel University. Wow. Gregory found a way to enjoy life as uniquely unfolding adventure. It is my sincere pleasure to turn the program over to Professor Gregory Cook. Gregory, the screen is yours, sir. Thank you, Suba. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, AARP Virginia uh, for uh, allowing me to um, present today on uh, Tuesday Explorers, as well as uh, Amber Sultane, who has been my primary contact here. But obviously, this was a team effort, and, and without mentioning everyone's name for the sake of brevity, I want to thank everyone involved in making this um, uh, program possible and for helping me spread the word about uh, African-American women of World War II and for uh, inviting me to participate in your uh, Black History Month celebration. Today I'm actually here, I, I wear multiple hats, so today I'm actually here rep representing the Basil and Becky Educational Foundation, which is my nonprofit that, that I use to you know, try and spread the word and do, do good work. 
Um, one of the things I want to uh, reference in my talk, I might use the term Negro colored Black African American interchangeably. Uh, the words uh, Negro and colored, I use those terms sometimes because that's how the women in the 1940s, that's how they self-identified. And the truth be told, I was a Negro until 1967 when James Brown came along and said, say it proud, I'm black and I'm proud. So in 1967, I went from being Negro to black. So I wanna make that, that, that clear. And also part of this uh, uh, story, this documentary is part of my own life journey This intertwined with this. So, um, you know, slide please. Um Dr. Cook, uh, Professor Cook, do you want the slide or do you want the 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 uh, video? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Video, please. I'm sorry. No, no worries. This is the introductory trailer to Professor Cook's documentary. Women wanted for war production work. More and more men are being called into the armed forces. Their jobs must be filled, and filled now. And who can fill them? You, you women. Working at the Navy Yard made me feel patriotic, that I did something to help the cause. We were doing something to help the boys, and it just made you feel special. He looked at us, we were all maybe 100 pounds apiece. He decided that we could be riveters. We wanted to go join, and at dinner was as far as, and I was told in my face that we cannot accept you because you're black. And I found out that they were putting three X's. I knew that was to recognize us as being Negroes, we were called at that time. We just felt like that we have a job to do at home, and I felt real, real good about that. And, I, and we, as women, we, we had to keep the home front up, because many of us did the jobs that they said only the men had done. The first day on the job at the Navy Yard, I was scared to death. When World War II started, you know, I wouldn't let myself cry for anything. I was going to be strong and brave. When men were in the service, the women had to take over, be the breadwinners, pay all the bills, and take care of the house. There was a racist notion that black women carried venereal disease and other kinds of diseases. I still suffer headaches. I take medication every day. Washington was deeply segregated. It was so segregated that you had the feeling that you were in a foreign country. He just worked hard all day, picking cotton to my fingers bled. Well, you were sort of in slavery when uh, you were sharecropping. He, he just said, nigga, if you bring your black ass in my office one more time and ask me a question, I'll fire you. In Alabama at that time, wasn't nothing free but a white man and a black woman. I was able to bring a paycheck home higher than anybody in my family. We can do it, and we did it. Thank you very much. Um, first slide, please. I'm here, Professor Cook. Give me one second. Oh, Sorry. sure. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize about that. Here we go. Okay, this is my uh, introduction. Uh, that image you see there, uh, the, 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 the young woman who posed for that, uh, she her name is Mrs. Ruth Wilson. She turns 100 on April 5th, uh, a couple of months from now. And uh, she posed for that picture. So that's called Victory. That image is, is called Victory. And you see the, the traditional image we see in, in her. So that's, that's called victory. And uh, she also says at her party, she's gonna do a pole dance. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, next slide, please. This is my mom, my favorite Rosie. Um, mom wrote on her suitcase, um, 
from Norfolk, Virginia to Washington, D.C. to get her very first job as the clerk typist in the U.S. Patent Office. And um, she had just graduated from high school. She was 18 years old. Uh, she was riding in a Jim Crow car and she arrived in a deeply segregated Washington. My mother used to tell me, told me this story two or three times uh, when I was a boy. Uh, I was probably three or four years old was before I started school. And um, I, I suspect the only reason why I remembered her story was because there was a train in it. And I've had a lifelong love affair with trains because nothing else in her story interested me as a three or four year old. But I do remember when my mom told me that story, her mood uh, elevated and she smiled. And I sometimes wonder if she was reflecting on the times when she was very independent because she was a stay at home mom. And, uh, you know, so I, I sometimes wonder now she was reflecting on that time as, 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 as maybe even a better time. And as already, and what was already mentioned in my bio, uh, my lifelong love affair by a, a, a variety of circumstances, I did wind up being a freight brakeman with Conrail and I did survive six train crashes. So, but mom got her first job as a clerk typist. And even though, um, her job was considered or what came to be known as more of a traditional female job. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is prior to, to, to the war, a lot of the jobs that we came to associate with women like typing, clerk, uh, uh, file clerks, those types of administrative positions were actually held by white men, in, at least in the government. And so prior, uh, when the war comes, those men you know, go, into the, go into the service and so uh, they need people to fill those jobs. And so the federal government sent out um, requests all across the country and, and also to black communities, encouraging women, black women to come to Washington to, uh, to get jobs. The, you know, not only uh, the jobs had to be replaced where the men left, but the, the federal government in Washington exploded uh, and multiplied exponentially and at one point, uh, the housing office in Washington was processing more than 100,000 applications each month for, for new people coming to Washington looking for, for housing. So uh, my mother was one of those women. She was in the war effort. Uh, and as we all know that nothing happens in business or government unless someone types a piece of paper for that to happen. Today, the paper's digital, but that's still the way the process works. So when I learned about my mom's role in the war and how she was living at that time, 18 years old, 1943, realizing that was in the middle of World War II, I have intentionally expanded the understanding of who Rosie's were, are, because uh, she was involved in the war effort. Technology and, and the patents that go with new technologies exploded during the war. So she was definitely active in that, in that, in that war effort. And so, you know, by my reckoning, she's a Rosie. Uh, next slide, please. Um, my personal journey into World War II started almost, uh, I'm going on 35 years now, and it's been a fight to uh, illuminate the contributions of African-Americans in World War II. Um, um, as you can see, uh, they're the, the unit patches of, of um, several of the more storied African, segregated African-American units uh, during World War II. But all of this actually started for me because I was spiritually compelled. And, and those are the only words I have. Um, I was spiritually compelled to go to Bastogne, Belgium, um, almost 35 years ago. And something got in my spirit, wouldn't let me go. So I went to Bastogne, Belgium. Uh, some of you in the audience may know that Bastogne was the focal point of the World War II Battle of the Bulge. It was the largest battle the uh, US Army has ever fought. And uh, there were thousands of black men in that, in, in that battle. These are three of the units um, of, of black soldiers who actually fought in the Battle of the Bulge. So I go into the museum there, the Martison Museum there, and I see African-Americans in the diorama. And it was the first time in my life I'd ever seen African-Americans associated with World War II. And it kind of blew me away. So as a result of that, I started researching and reading and learning everything I could about African-Americans in World War II. 
And I learned, for example, I, I mostly focused on Europe, but I learned, for example, that at the end of the war, there were like 455,000 African-American men and women in, in Europe. And that research led me to uh, Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain is a place where they also had a, a large number of female workers. Actually, they had a larger proportion of women working than we had in, in the States. Um, but by, by uh, doing research in Great Britain, I, I came across the female workers there and then keep going, you know, I was working backward almost. And that's when I, I discovered uh, and started looking at what we now call Rosie the Riveters. And uh, somewhere between five and 8 million American women of all stripes went to work during World War II and their employment was directly related to the war. Okay, and so once I started looking at Rosie's, all you know, and, and most of the research out there is on is on white Americans, white Rosie's, I came across um, um, uh, um, um, the fact that there were six hundred thousand African American women who were Rosie's. Next slide, please. Um, Dr. Maureen Honey uh, compiled a, a text called Bitter Fruit. Uh, she's also in the documentary. And that was where I first uh, came across the number of 600,000. And I, I, I've since run across that number in other places. If anyone really wants to learn more about it, uh, about African-Americans and uh, Rosie the Rivers, this is a good book because it's a book of letters, editorials, personal recollections of black women who are actually working during the time. And they talked about their own struggles. All the material in there is not by women. Uh, there's some noted poets in there, et cetera, Langston Hughes, authors, et cetera. So I would highly recommend this book uh, called Bitter Fruit. And uh, next shot, please. So there were challenges I had in, in making the documentary uh, primarily um, uh, two challenges, maybe three. Um, one of the first ones, when I realized there were 500, uh, 600,000 African-American Rosies, you know, how was I gonna find these women? Because at the, point, at, at the point I started doing research on this, most of those women were already in their early 90s. And so I knew as a group, most of them had already trans transitioned and my job was gonna be, how do I find and locate these women? So one of the things I did was to talk to people I knew word of mouth uh, and, and, and to start and ask people to start asking family members, you know, what did they do during World War II? So that was one of the ways I, I, I found people. Uh, the other was I went to, I, I got in contact with a number of um, nursing and senior facilities where, uh, where there were black women and I would go and ask the administrators if they could put a little blurb in the in-house newsletter. And so that was another way I found women. And as a result, um, you know, I, I managed to locate at least eight of whom who, who are in the documentary. Um, the, um, no, you can, you can go back please to, yeah, thank you. Um, the, um, Ironically, like I said, I started this documentary in 2009 and I didn't have resources really. I, I did this out of my own pocket. I got people to work for free. And um, ironically, had I had all the money, this documentary would have been completed probably in 2011, 2012. But in hindsight, I now understand that had I completed this documentary in 2011, 2012, it wasn't the historic moment for it to get the attention it's getting now. And I would say the biggest factor in all this was, um, we're in, we're, was what happened to George Floyd. George Floyd seemed to uh, open up all kinds of, uh, you know, really dark corners about this country's history and its, and its present behavior toward uh, women, toward people of color. And we're in a time of reckoning. And, and so I think, because my documentary came out or is, is, is in this, this, this historic moment right now, I think that's one of the reasons why it's getting the kind of attention uh, it's getting. Also black women, African-American women 
are stepping forward in unprecedented ways and they're feeling, fueling their own fires and progress. And they're doing that independent of whether they have allies or not. But once I met the women, I encountered something that I was totally uh, surprised about. Only one of the eight roses in my documentary knew that she had done anything that, that she had done anything historically significant. For the women in the documentary, for them, World War II was just a good paying job, the best paying job they could have ever hoped for. And so, you know, World War II lasted a minute in their lives. And after the war, they went, they got on with their lives. Uh, they didn't do that for the most part. They didn't do the kind of work after the war that they did during the war. And so they never talked about it. Often their family members didn't know what they had done. And because it, you know, it, they didn't see it as a big deal. And so, um, like I said, all of the women except one, I had to, I gave them a brief history lesson and then I had to talk them into being, to appearing in the documentary. And fortunately I, I was successful there. Thank, next slide, please. Yes. So who, who were Rosie's? Um, Rosie's were women who took the places of overwhelmingly white males in industry and government in hundreds, if not uh, thousands of different job categories during World War II. And what I would say to all everyone listening and watching today, um, you may have, you, you, there's a good chance you may have fam, you know, Rosie's in your family, women who did extraordinary things during World War II, but if you don't ask, they won't tell. And so what I would say is if these women did work like my mom for the federal government, or if they did traditional man's work, they were certainly Rosie's. And I think you should talk to them, you know, ask some questions in your family because these women are full of history. Next slide, please. This is the image that uh, most people know. I put it at the top, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. Some of you may be old enough to remember that slogan when Westinghouse sold televisions uh, on TV. But this image, uh, you know, this image is, is what has come to represent the empowerment of American women. But this image had no play during World War II. This image didn't really start to, to come into the public eye until about the 1960s. This image was actually an in-house two-week public relations program by Westinghouse Corporation to get, and its goal was to get white women to come to work, to get white women to come to work on time, and to get white women to come to work and be productive. Large numbers of white women had never worked outside the home before, so they were unfamiliar with you know, what it means, you know, the, the obligations and responsibilities of that type of employment, keeping in mind that, you know, many of these women were also balancing, you know, the, uh, the challenges of being, of, of being mothers. And so this, this image you see uh, was actually just a two week campaign. And as we know, it has gained a lot more traction, uh, you know, since the war. But during the war, these women didn't, they weren't called Rosies. They, they were just workers, okay? So Rosies were welders, typists, assembly line workers, riveters, aircraft makers, munitions handlers, shipbuilders, electronic assemblers, and sheet metal workers. You get the point. Those are some of the occupations the women had who were in my documentary. And two of the more famous Rosies include Maya Angelou and uh, the late Ruby Dee, the actress. So that's an idea of who the Rosies were, but then it also opens up the questions who were black Rosies. Next slide, please. Okay, so, you know, who were black Rosies? I mean, clearly as women, uh, they shared many of the, you know, same characteristics of, of, of uh, you know, white Rosies. However, they were they were African, they were, they were they were Negro, they were colored. And so that was a whole different ball game back then. And so we have to remember that for these women, uh, the law of the land on World War II was Jim Crow, segregation, very little opportunity to vote in all aspects of life. So Negroes were legally, politically, economically, educationally, and socially uh, unequal. 
And uh, to give you some idea of what that meant prior to the war, you know, uh, and, and you also have to remember that black women have always worked. Working was not an option for black women. So prior to the war, more than 80% of all black women who were employed uh, were either domestics in the homes of well-to-do whites or they were sharecroppers. And if you were a domestic, you might have been making $5 a week, uh, depending upon where you were working for 10, 12 hour days. Or if you were a sharecropper, you probably weren't getting paid at all. And, you know, and that was because sharecropping was really a 100 year extension of enslavement. So that was the plight of, uh, of black women at that time. And um, as I said, black women have always worked, but the war created opportunities for them that uh, they would have never had. Um, one woman, um, you know, I, I read something by a black woman and, and she said, uh, Abraham Lincoln may have freed the slaves, but it took Adolf Hitler to get, to get black women out of white women's kitchens. And there's a lot of truth to that. So if you, if you look at the 600,000, that number, that 600,000 of black women, if you were to put them in, a, in one city, all 600,000 in one American city, uh, based upon the 1940 census, the last census before the war, they would have been the 13th largest, most populous city in America. That's a whole lot of folks. And yet very few people know about them. Next slide, please. Um, hmm. that's, well, okay. Um, in any event, um, you know, Willie, next, uh, next slide, please. There we go. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, this is, um, Mrs. Uh, Willie May Govan and, you know, black women were patriotic. I mean, they were Americans and they did the things that all, all Americans did to help this country win the war. And, and she said that America belongs to me too. And she really meant that. And, and she did all kinds of patriotic things uh, to help this country win the war. And you, you also have to remember during the war, it would have been very, very difficult to find an American family that didn't have skin in the game, right? You had 16 million people in the military, you had millions of people uh, working in fact yard, uh, uh, factories, shipyards. You had, you had people conducting bond drives, air raid wardens. So many American families were connected to the war directly or indirectly. So it would have, you know, patriotism was very widespread because, you know, we were everyone, you know, most people were patriotic. Next, next slide, please. This is uh, Gwen Faison. You know, one of the patriotic things that a lot of people did during the war, she bought war bonds. You know, during the war, America actually paid for the war. You know, no credit card, just paid for the war. And, what, and the way they did that was to sell war bonds to the public. And so when they sold uh, war bonds, um, um, that was the, the government got the money, the citizens got the bonds with interest. And for Gwen Faison, it was one of the ways in which she, she used that money uh, with her husband to buy her first home. Uh, next slide, please. This is Mrs. Ruth Wilson, the model in the, uh, the, the painting I showed you in Victory. Um, she was a young woman. She was married. She had a couple of kids. Her, her husband was overseas in England. Okay, getting ready to go into the European theater of war. But one of the patriotic things she did she used to go dancing and socializing at the segregated USO clubs. I mean, uh, World War II saw more Americans on the move than ever before or since in this country's history. And so the USOs were opportunities for um, uh, servicemen and women to come and relax, dance, meet people, etc. So Mrs. Wilson, you know, she used to go there and dance and she told me, she said, she used to stay out that she if she could get a babysitter she'd be out dancing till two in the morning and had to get up and go to work at six but you know again she was a young woman next slide please um 
as part of, you know, as far as the patriotism, it, it, again, it was a double-edged sword for Black people because um, we were supporting the war effort, but yet African-Americans, Negroes, colored folks, Black people were all second-class citizens. And so uh, in January 1942, a young, a young man wrote into the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper, and he raised the question, we are treated bad, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, we're treated badly in this country, why should we fight? And, and so as a, you know, and so as a result of that, the editor of the newspaper uh, created uh, this campaign called the Double V Campaign. And it was a rallying cry for black people throughout the war. And uh, the Double V stood for uh, victory overseas against Nazism and fascism and victory over uh, victory at home against racism. And, uh, and despite the patriotism of these folks, thousands of colored women wanted to work or join the military. And it was an acute labor shortage throughout the war, but they were denied simply because of, of the color of their skin. Next image, please. Okay, so as I said, throughout the war, there was an acute labor shortage, but many companies just refused to hire black women. And, and a lot of it was because they were afraid that their white workers would either quit or go on strike. And so as a result, black women were the last hired and the first fired. Most black women in, uh, in industry got their jobs in 1944, the last full year of the war. So there was just this overall reluctance to hire black women. Um, next slide, please. We have Mrs. Wilson again. Um, as I said earlier, she was a domestic, but she quit her job as a domestic, got training in one of the government sponsored training schools. And she became a, um, a uh, she went to Bach uh, High School. She, she got training as a sheet metal specialist. And uh, upon graduation, she went and got a job at the Philadelphia Navy Yard and helped build an aircraft carrier, the USS Valley Forge. Next, please. This is Susan King. She was an actual riveter in Baltimore at Eastern Aircraft. She went downtown with a few of her friends, again, to in downtown Baltimore to a government training facility. Uh, she said they took a look at her. She said she was about 100 pounds. And, and the guy said, you can be a riveter. So here we have a, a literal Rosie the Riveter. Next, please. This is Marion Reed. She was a sharecropper and a student. And uh, all of her brothers, but one left for the military, uh, they were drafted. And so when her brothers left the farm, you know, she and her sisters had to pick up the slack. And she told me that she learned how to operate all the heavy ma machinery on the farm. And she said, I thought I could do anything, especially on the farm. So here we have that empowerment of a black woman again, uh, thrust upon her, but she rose to the challenge. Next, please. And this is Bernice Bowman, who was a clerk typist in the general accounting office. And, you know, again, we, we see the, the other side of that knife cutting. Uh, black women were usually paid less than white women for the same job. I mean, that, that, and that persisted throughout the war. And of course, all women were paid less than the white males who had the jobs prior to the war. And um, uh, Mrs. Bowman told me that uh, where she worked, um, you know, you, um, Whites were given promotions to a grade two, but none of the black women, none of the black women were ever promoted. The interesting thing about the US military and the federal government, based upon your category, everyone made the same. So if you were a private in the US Army and you were black or white, everybody got the same pay. If you were a, a, a level one or level two or whatever in the government, everyone at that level got the same pay. So there was no discrimination within the pay grades, but there was discrimination um, in terms of who was getting promotions. But despite these inequities, these injustices, black women were still making more than they had ever made before, and they remained patriotic and supportive of the war. Next slide, please. Segregation, um, 
you know, in the job in 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 the uh, in in the job market and in, in the jobs themselves, segregation was maintained wherever possible by companies. Uh, in, based upon the images I've seen, as well as talking to the women, it was very rare in a factory where you would have, let's say, a black and a white woman working together. It did periodically happen, but for the most part, that that would have been unusual. Um, and 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 you know, segregation was very problematic in the things that came with it. So in Baltimore in 1945. 22 white women went on strike at Western Electric. Western Electric was part of Bell Telephone. And they went on strike because uh, management hired a handful of black women in an all white department. And the, the black women did not want, to, I'm sorry, the white women did not want to share toilet facilities with them. So they went on strike. And management refused to build separate um, restroom facilities. But so what happened was uh, there were also a lot of other racial fireworks going on in Baltimore at the time too, Bethlehem Steel and over on the docks where you had shipbuilding and, and, and heavy manufacturing, there was a lot of racial tension there too because there you had black men getting jobs that, uh, that, that brought about this resentment uh, from whites. But in contrast to all this, you, uh, Mrs. Wilson talked about how at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, she called it, she said it was like a League of Nations there. And she said, if they didn't like you, they didn't show it. So not every place had a lot of tension, but, uh, you know, America's racial attitudes and behaviors and practices were on full display throughout the war. Next, please. Uh, her name is Reese Taylor. And uh, Mrs. Govan, who was in Alabama, I think had the best line of the documentary. And she said, um, at that time in Alabama, wasn't nothing free but a white man and a black woman. And so we're talking about sexual harassment and th the term didn't even exist during World War II. Mrs. Govan is the only woman I interviewed who acknowledged sexual harassment. But uh, it, I know it went on. I have a feeling it was very widespread. White women were subjected to it too. There were no laws or protections against, uh, for them against unscrupulous uh, bosses or unscrupulous uh, co-workers. And so, um, you know, it was a problem throughout, throughout the war, but it's something that a lot of women, you know, chose not to talk about or, or, or highlight. But we know it goes on a lot today with laws in place. So you can imagine, you can just use your imagination to understand what, what it was like uh, in 1944, 43 during the war. So um, there were also other uh, job dangers. Ne next slide, please. This is Alice Amaro. She, she made uh, 30 millimeter shells at Frankfurt Arsenal. And you know, again, during the war, there, were, there weren't many, if any, protections for workers. So the workplace in heavy industry was especially dangerous. So while working at the Frankfurt Arsenal, she got uh, TNT poisoning, got into her blood, made her sick. She lost time from work, but eventually she recovered and went back to work. And again, going back to Mrs. Govan, Mrs. Govan made uh, gunpowder at E.I. E. I. DuPont in, in Childersburg, Alabama. And one of the things she told me, she said, very few white women worked where she did, and the ones who did worked in the, fact, in, in the office, not where she did. But Mrs. Govan said that uh, it was so dangerous where she worked that um, every day for about four hours, they had to send her outside and she cut grass or did those kinds of things because the work was so dangerous. But she also said she was damaged by the war. That's the direct quote. She takes medication every day for her head. She has headaches. And she said she thinks the war, the, uh, the war damaged her. She says she can't prove it, but she says, quote, only God and I know what happened there. And so, um, you know, so there were uh, hazards and dangers to the job. And these were hazards and dangers that everybody faced, black, white, male, female. It was just the work environment 
back then. Next slide, please. So there were always politics. There were a lot of politics going on to open the doors for black women to get these jobs and to have these opportunities. So Mary McLeod Bethune was probably almost certainly at that time, the most powerful black person in America. And I maintain that if I could create a Mount Rushmore of, of African-Americans, she would be one of the faces on Mount Rushmore. She was that significant. A lot of people don't know who she was uh, and, that, and, and, and that's uh, unfortunate. I would, I would give her some perspective to say she was the Martin Luther King of her time. That's how significant she was to the upliftment of black women in, in particular and black people in, in general. And uh, so her contributions cannot be understated. And part of her legacy is uh, the National Council of Negro Women, uh, the largest black female organization in the world. It is global and it has more than 2 mil million members. Um, but she was a key player. And uh, next slide, please. She was in charge of uh, the black cabinet. These, the, as you can see, she's right in the middle front row and everybody else there, they're men. These are black men who were advisors to the president or uh, advisors to various government uh, offices, government departments on Negro affairs. And as you see, uh, Dr. Bethune is the only woman there and all of these men deferred to her and acknowledged and recognized her as the president or head of the black cabinet. Next slide, please. Here we have, uh, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt. One of the things Bethune was able to do, she had a great relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt, um, who was, you know, the first lady. And, um, and because she had this relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, she had easy access to, to the president. And uh, Eleanor Roosevelt um, and, and Mrs. Bethune worked together in a lot of different ways. Next slide, please. This is Bertia Bush. Um, uh, she worked in the War Department uh, and, and she was a clerk, but she also engaged in, in civil rights activities in her free time. But Mrs. Bush worked, um, you know, when she went to apply for a job, she told me that Mary Bethune and Eleanor Roosevelt worked together to get people's pictures taken off of the job application. So, the women could not be discriminated against. But Mrs. Bush told me when she came up to get her interview, she peeped over and she saw that the woman interviewing her put three X's beside her name. And that was a signal that she was Negro. So again, you know, you had, there's this other obstacle that, you know, these women had, you know, African-Americans had to deal with. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, but it was their friendship between Bethune and Roosevelt, for example, they were very instrumental in getting the Tuskegee Airmen airborne. Uh, Mary Bethune handpicked uh, Major Charity Adams to take the 6888 Postal Battalion overseas to Great Britain and France. It was the largest black unit, it was the largest contingent of black women uh, battalion, about 755 women, the largest contingent of black women to go overseas during the war. And uh, both women were instrumental in um, you know, getting black women into the army as nurses or as part of the Women's Army Corps. And despite the fact that there were thousands of black women who wanted to join those organizations, most never got in because of uh, racism. And, and as an aside, if you were a black nurse and you went to Europe because some did, uh, you were the only people you could attend to were black soldiers and German POWs. Okay, uh, next slide, please. This is a Philip Randolph, and he was um, uh, head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, and they were basically the people on the trains, uh, on passenger trains, who cooked and cleaned and serviced their their white clientele. And so he unionized uh, hundreds of, of, of black men in that capacity. Uh, but you gotta remember World War II brought America out of the Great Depression. 
And, um, but Negroes were still hurting. I mean, the, the Great Depression ended for black, for, for white Americans, but there was still a problem in the black, in the black community. A. Philip Randolph uh, started the March on Washington movement. And by the way, this is the same guy who organized and planned uh, the March on Washington in 63, where King did his I Have a Dream thing. But in 1940, June, uh, A. Philip Randolph was going to bring 100,000 Black people to Washington, D.C. to demonstrate against uh, discrimination in hiring poor housing, employment, basically just the overall condition of Black folks, but he was going to focus on the lack of job opportunities. Excuse me. So when he, when he talks to Franklin Roosevelt and tells FDR what his plans are, Roosevelt blinks because Roosevelt is, is concerned that if he brings 100,000 Black people to Washington to protest, the Germans and the Japanese, we, we were not in the war in 1940, in June, but he was concerned that the Germans and Japanese would use that demonstration as propaganda, illuminating American racism and, and hypocrisy. So as a result of that, FDR signed Executive Order 8802, which, which theoretically eliminated gender and racial discrimination in defense industries. Over, overall, the door opened for black people and, and specifically for black women to get these jobs. Next slide, please. One of the cornerstones, one of the ideological reasons for, black, for America being in the war was articulated by Franklin Roosevelt and he called it the four freedoms, freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom from want and the freedom from fear. Well, the freedom from want and the freedom from fear were, were entities that African-Americans, Negroes did not enjoy at that time. We were, uh, African-Americans were uh, economically at the, you know, at the bottom rungs of the economic ladder. And there was still a lot of racial violence directed toward black people through uh, lynchings and, and assaults on the street and those kinds of things. So, you know, while FDR talked about his four freedoms, quite frankly, he was actually, he was really talking about the freedoms of Europeans and, and white Americans. He was not talking about um, the, the 12 or 13 million black people in America at that time. And uh, one of the things that happened during the war and continues to happen that is that there was this perception and, and it was a real perception that black people were making some progress in jobs and housing and education, but there was this ongoing backlash from white Americans that the perception seemed to be that because black people are making progress that they were somehow or another losing something. And as a result of that, there was ongoing violence against black people throughout the country. I mean, it, had, it has always been like that, but during the war, there was an, an uptick in that because uh, of, of increased competition. So for example, in Detroit, the black population increased by 50,000 people in, you know, in Detroit. And that meant pressure in schools, pressure in housing, pressure for jobs. And, um, and, it was, and, and, and there was a problem with that for whites. And so uh, in June, uh, 9, June 20 to 22nd, um, there was a riot in Detroit. Let me also say there, there were, the World War II was probably the most racially violent time in, this, in, in the 20th century. And 1943 was the worst of the worst. So in June, in June 1943, there was a riot in Detroit, uh, somewhat fueled by rumors, but it had been building for a while because of the things I mentioned, competition for jobs, housing, education. And um, dozens of people were killed, most of them black. The army was called into Detroit and stayed there for a long time as a means of, of, of uh, maintaining law and order. Not um, disconnected from this, but thematically, two days later in a place called Bamber Bridge, England, 
there was a shootout between black and white Americans in this little town in England resulting in the death of a black soldier. And as quiet as it was kept at the time, there were, there were gunfights and, and shootouts across Great Britain during World War II as the American army was building up the D-Day. But you also had a riot in Philadelphia, August 1944, when PTC, Philadelphia Transportation Company, hired the first black motorman. Um, and the all, -white, the all white union went on strike and Philadelphia was the largest, had the largest and most diverse war industry in the country. And so because they shut down public transportation that obviously had a negative impact on the war effort, FDR sent the army in again. And the commanding general told the head of the all white union, he said, y'all got 48 hours to go back to work or you're gonna be overseas. So the strike ended within 48 hours, but as a result of that, all of the streetcars and buses were manned by um, armed troops with, fi with fixed bayonets riding behind the, the, the motormen. And so, um, you know, so, you know, again, in 1943 alone, there were, there were you, know, you know, almost 250 attacks um, against blacks by whites. And, um, you know, next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. So this is, you know, an example of, of some of the stuff going on in, in, in Detroit. Next slide, please. Uh, the violence, you know, the violence was also a problem. You know, lynchings did, did uh, there were still lynchings in, in America and, and women were being attacked and assaulted and, and, and lynched as well. And uh, officially there were 10 lynchings in America during during World War II, but there were almost certainly a lot more than that. And again, all a lot of that was about the, the the backlash of white Americans against the perception that black people were making progress. So what I can say about um, America's unity during the war is that I think everyone, all Americans were pretty much pulling in the same direction because so many people had skin in the game. Everybody wanted their loved ones to come home safely and, and you know, get life back to normal. The, but the deal was every, all Americans were pulling in the same direction, but we pulled separately. Black folks were pulling with their double V and white folks were pulling wherever they were pulling to, to maintain as much of the status quo as they could. So, um, next slide, please. So, um, the war experience for, for, for Black Rosies, I would say, was a mixed bag, more positive than negative. Uh, but remember, after the, after the war, 1945, uh, America was still a country where you had legalized racism and systemic disenfranchisement for black people after the war. And so most black people couldn't most, you know, there were 1.1 million black people, men and women in the service uh, during World War II. They were entitled to the GI Bill. Most could never use the GI Bill. And most could never uh, buy the houses with the cheap mortgages, or they could not use the educational part of the GI Bill because of, of systemic uh, racism in this country. And so here we have, again, Marion Reed, and she said her, her, all of her brothers but one went off to fight and they came home safely. But she told me, she said, after the war, her parents could not vote and her brothers who risked their lives could not vote. Um, so after the war, many of these women returned to domestic service for a while, because that was pretty much what was there for them. But there was a lot of black women and black people who left the South during World War II and they did not return. And, uh, but again, right after the war, many of these women, the only thing available to them was uh, getting jobs as domestics. And, uh, but, you know, when the civil rights movement start kicking up speed in the late 40s, early 1950s, things begin to slowly change for black women and their options for employment gradually increased. And actually the, 
the employment of black women in domestic service and in sharecroppers actually started to decline about 1940. So Black Rosie's force a sense, uh, a new sense of self-confidence, uh, self-determination. Uh, and uh, it, it was the, the kind of thing that gave them life skills uh, that many of them would, 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 were able to use for the rest of their lives. Um, next slide, please. We have Ruth Wilson again. And she told me, she said, after the war, there was a letdown because of the big, the big money was gone. And, uh, and she went back to, do, to, to domestic work, but eventually by chance, she got a, a job in a doctor's office. And from there went to a coat factory where she worked for 28 years. And then she retired from there and then got another job at AAA um, uh, where she worked for 13 years. And so she, I talked to her this morning, she told me she has dual pensions, which is, you know, as a black woman, you know, from that time period, that's phenomenal. And she's getting social security. So, you know, World War II and, and the things that happened right after that were very positive for her. Next slide, please. Susan King, as I said, was a riveter at Eastern Aircraft. She eventually uh, got a graduate degree from Morgan State University. She became a high school teacher and a guidance counselor. Next slide, please. This is Willie May Govan. And I think I'm impressed with all these women, but maybe she, I'm most impressed with her. Uh, she was born in Alabama. She dropped out of high school in 10th grade because she had to tend to her mother until her mother passed away. Uh, Mrs. Govan was small. She walked five miles to the EI DuPont plant to get her job. Uh, but here's the thing about her. She didn't get her high school diploma until she was 60. Once she got her high school diploma, she became an ordained minister. Once she became an ordained minister, she built, she, she bought a piece of land. Once she bought a piece of land, she built a church. And this is all from a woman who started out like all of these women in very humble circumstances. Next slide, please. Gwendolyn Faison grew up, you know, she grew up picking cotton and strawberries. And she told me she would do that before she walked three or four miles to school every day. She left the war. She tried to get into the service, but they wouldn't let her in because she was black. Uh, she, she was in North Carolina. She migrated to Camden, New Jersey, worked at RCA. She, she, was, she worked as a supervisor because she was good at math, but they didn't give her more money, nor did she give her, give her the title, but she was doing supervisory work. Uh, she was also the first or second black woman to sell products on TV. Lena Horne might've been the first, but she was a very attractive woman. And so in the 1950s, she was actually selling TVs and radios, RCA TVs and radios on television. And she later got involved in politics. She became the first female African-American mayor of Camden, New Jersey. She was 73 years old when she became mayor. And sadly, uh, she transitioned last July and, 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 and I, met, I miss her. And I reached out to her daughter yesterday because she was born on Valentine's Day. And yesterday she would have been 97 years old. Next photo, please. So, you know, given their prospects at birth, born during or before the Great Depression, I would say generally the lives of these women improved economically, politically, and socially and many of them lived to see a black man in the White House. And so their legacy is that they brought millions of dollars into the black community. Uh, they gained a self-confidence in themselves as women and as Negroes. They influenced the American labor movement, dispelled racial and gender stereotypes about what they could and could not do. And they backboned the civil rights movement. Same group of women. And so arguably, they are the most significant group of Black women in the 20th century. And we need, to repeat, we need to remember them as being patriotic, courageous, determined, resilient, faithful. They are our greatest generation. And I want to say that again. We need to remember them as patriotic, courageous, determined, resilient, and faithful. They are our greatest generation. Thank you.
<laughs> Sorry, I'm not the only one that's slow on technology. <laughs> um, do we have another video that we're showing? Not yet. Okay. You ready for me to go to questions? Yes. Okay. <laughs> the first question that I had, Gregory, was um, a couple of people were interested in, can they purchase the victory poster? Um, I had the, the, um, uh, the short answer is no. Uh, that was an oil painting I had commissioned. I had 100 of them uh, signed and numbered. And I just sold the last one about three weeks ago. Um, that picture will be hanging in the Dutch embassy in Washington. Um, I'm thinking about doing something else, but I, I, I don't know yet. And uh, hit me up at, at my, uh, you know, at my email address and I'm working on it. So there might be something else uh, with that image in it. Okay. You just mentioned the Dutch embassy. We had a yes. question about, did the Dutch government recently honor the Black Rosies? Yes, they did. The, the, the Dutch government uh, honored, uh, and we, we had a live screening of the documentary last, well, in December in Washington, D.C. The Dutch have this real interesting relationship with African Americans because uh, there are 170 some odd black men buried in the American cemetery in the Netherlands. They were part of the liberating force in 1945. And so the Dutch have, have acknowledged the Rosies because they built the planes, the tanks, the ships, and all the mechanisms of war that were used to help the men help liberate their country. And so what happened in December, the Dutch government gave official proclamations to all of the women who were in the documentary thanking them uh, and, their, and, and their daughters. In some cases, only their daughters were present. But I thought it was a hell of a thing to do. And in many ways, this government has yet to acknowledge African-American Rosies. But I must say, in fairness, there, there, uh, there is a Congressional Gold Medal that was awarded in, I think, November of 21. I'm, I'm a little fuzzy with my time because of COVID. It's either November 20 or November 21. There is a Congressional Gold Medal dedicated to the Rosies. Uh, there's a backlog of World War II medals, so it may not be available at the earliest until December of this year, but I'm told that uh, uh, there will be part of the image, there will be a black woman on the medal. So that is the nation's uh, collective um, uh, recognition of what American women do. And lastly, I'd like to say my personal view is I don't think American women, no matter what color they were, I don't think American women have gotten their just due and recognition for what they did. I agree. <laughs> Another question is, uh, did your research uncover many Black women that were accepted into the WASPs? If I remember correctly, WASP is Women's Air Force Service yeah. pilots? Right. Okay. Um, I didn't find any. Someone's recently told me about that. I, I have to dig a little bit into it. It wasn't my lane, per se, and I never stumbled across it. across it. Uh, I won't discount it. I mean, every now, you know, my learning curve has gone kind of flat, but every now and then I still run across stuff that says, wow. So about two years ago, I learned that there were actually black women in Washington, D.C. who were code breakers, college educated black women who were code breakers. Hmm. Of course, because they were black, they started out emptying trash and mopping floors, college educated. But uh, so, you know, I'm still learning. Um, yeah. Okay. What about minority women that might have been employed in the Oak Ridge, the Atomic City component? I don't know that. No. Okay. No. Um, no, I don't. I'm looking through to see if I have any other questions for you. I've got very wonderful comments about how much they uh, are enjoying this program. Thank you. 
and one that says this is an important story that needs to be told more often. And it was a spectacular presentation. Thank you. And that looks like all the questions I have. So Suba, I'm gonna throw it back to you. All right. Well, thank you, Trudy. Um, Gregory, on behalf of ARP Virginia, uh, we'd all like to thank you uh, for sharing your valuable time and knowledge, knowledge with us this afternoon. One thing I certainly learned uh, that I had not ever heard of was the National Council of Negro Women that was started by Dr. Bethune, as you said, the female MLK. Um, and her relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt. I know one thing about Eleanor Roosevelt is she gave credibility to the Tuskegee Airmen by flying with them. And that gave her husband saying, oh, wow, my wife flew with them. So that kind of gave them some credibility. But are, are there any books written about Dr. Bethune? Uh, yes, there are, but I can't quote them. I just know there are, there are a ton of books and articles about her. I'd also like to make a comment about Eleanor Roosevelt. Okay. Uh, and, and, and I don't know the history of First Lady, so I'm not going to try and get out of my lane. But what little I do know is Eleanor Roosevelt was the first First Lady who actually did something, <laughs> right? And by my reckoning, if you were to take all the first ladies and stack them all on top of each other in their contributions, they would not come up to her knees. Okay. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt took on, she took on black people, <laughs> very unpopular <laughs> during the war and at any time. Yes. And like you said, she flew with the Tuskegee Airmen. She did amazing things with, 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 and, and put her name and reputation out there. And, you know, not to knock first ladies today, but they go with safe things, issues that, you know, you're not going to get pushback on those issues. Yeah. Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt was a totally different woman. And, yes. And she was a giant. Yes, I totally, totally agree with you. A thousand percent on that. Yep. She's one of my heroes. Yeah. Um, but folks, we'd love to get your feedback on today's program and ideas for future programs in the chat box. You'll see a link to a survey. Please click on the link and take a few moments to share your feedback with us. We'll also send this link in a follow-up email later today. Gregory, talk about a documentary. It'll be screened in March as part of our Movies for Grownups, the ARP Movies for Grownups. Check out the event calendar in the chat box. We invite you to continue to celebrate Black History Month with us. Our Tuesday Explorer programs this February have focused on the rich contributions of African Americans to our local communities and beyond. Next Tuesday, again at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we invite you to join us on a virtual tour of the National Portrait Galleries Collection dedicated to African American history makers. In the chat box, you'll see a link to register for these and other Black History Month programs. Until next time, we encourage you to stay curious and keep exploring. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you.